Today at the Linux Certification Virtual Summit, we have Brian Smith here with us to tell us how he passed the Linux Professional Institute certification. Number one, Brian, how are you? I'm doing well. How's yourself? I am doing good. I cannot complain. Thank you for being here with us today. So let's get right into it. Tell me, who is Brian? Oh, I always say first and foremost, I'm a technologist. I understand systems and technologies, not so much products, although if you have that foundation, you can understand any product. So I, uh, I'm a traditionally educated engineer and even spent some time in aerospace and semiconductor. Uh, I actually grew up in a civil engineering household. But uh, by turn of the century, I got into consulting and contracting and worked all over the U.S. And uh, in the mid-00s, uh, I started working with Red Hat as well as LPI. Uh, at one point, I did directly work for Red Hat. And uh, I've continued working with LPI because uh, I feel like the, the two organizations have a great uh, complementary. Uh, compl they really complement each other as far as their programs, their focus, and everything else, uh, even people who work for Red Hat end up working on a lot of distributions and a lot with a lot of maintainers across many companies. And that's really what I enjoy about Linux. And uh, that's pretty much why I just keep uh, finding ways to work with open source everywhere I go since, you know, the late 90s. Oh, great, great. So you said you worked for Red Hat and LPI. How were both of those experiences? First with Red Hat, like what did you need to know in order to, to get a job with Red Hat? Because I know there's a lot of people out here who would love to work for both Red Hat and LPI. So uh, actually, I uh, in the early OOs, I passed both the Lipic 1 and 2 and then the Red Hat certified at the time technician, now system administrator and engineer exams. And I ended up working alongside Red Hat at one point, a couple different places, and they finally brought me in after a couple of years as a direct employee. So I was working in professional services and going out to major customers. Uh, at, you know, around the same time, I had also been involved with some of the exam writing, including for Olympic One. I helped uh, write the version two uh, exams, uh, and I've also worked with Matt Rice over the years on the objectives when he came in. I believe it was uh, around 2005. And uh, ever since then, I've, I've given my opinions probably more than <laughs> more than a lot of the work. Matt, I know, and others at LPI are really the heart of that program <laughs> and, and really keep it going and keep a lot of us in line. Uh, it's easy to get uh, off focus, off scope. And uh, I, I've always enjoyed uh, the open approach that LPI takes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for those gems. OK, so what made you decide to become uh, LPIC 1, LPIC 2 certified? The big thing was the, the broadness of the exam, all the topics they cover. I, I kid you not, it was just two months ago. I was at my company, and we were, of course, using Red Hat systems. And we had an issue with YUM, which is a program that updates the system. And, you know, there's a lot of things with Red Hat, the exams they can't get to. It's all hands-on, uh, specific tasks, great right from that standpoint, objectives. But LPI is so broad. Uh, I was quickly able to troubleshoot in a matter of minutes, and I didn't realize they had been plaguing them for days, that it was a library issue. And they had in interjected a library to replace something else. And there's an entire objective on the LD cache in Lipic uh, 1, I believe it's in the 101 objectives, that totally explains all that. And it was maybe within five minutes I had to completely troubleshoot it. And that's something you're only going to get on the LPI exam, which is why even for people who run Red Hat, I highly recommend uh, LPI certified level one people as well. Mm, perfect, perfect. Thank you. So I know you mentioned that you started uh, working with Linux in the 200s. Uh, what, what introduced you to the world of Linux? So really, my first introduction with Linux is when 1993, where there was a company called Ig Ig Yggdrasil. I, I, I always mispronounce it. It begins with a Y. And uh, they didn't last very long, but they had a distribution called GLX, which stood, stood for GNU, Linux, and X window. And uh, it literally just, I got a one gigabyte drive, which was huge at the time, a nice scuzzy one gigabyte drive. I installed it alongside Windows, DOS Windows, and it kind of really took off from there. I thought it was kind of neat. And then you had the CERN web server that was that was catching on, and then the patches for it, which became Apache server, Apache, uh, and started running that at a, a civil engineering firm I was interning at the time in college. And I remember saying to myself in 1994, early 1994, I said, ah, oh, this Linux stuff is kind of neat, you know, uh, it'll be a college academic exercise, but NT is the future. And I remember by late 1994, when the web really started taking off and NT was having a lot of issues and the Windows 95, which was Chicago at the time, code name, was starting to cause a lot of issues. Like, Microsoft can't get their act together, but these Linux guys really know what they're doing. <laughs> so I found the job very quickly. I ended up becoming, I was an OS2 guy, an NT guy, now a Linux guy. Uh, along with Unix, I had some Unix background, which really helped a lot of SCO. 
And I found jobs really quickly. And by 1996, the fact that I knew Linux and knew Solaris and as well as NT really helped. And by 97, I was doing Linux almost 100% of the time. Uh, I still had some NT administration and other things, but I was finding that my Linux knowledge was selling myself. And sure enough, by 99, the uh, CAD CAM world and aerospace, which I'd gotten into, had gone Linux. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft thought they were going to get that market, but the NVIDIA cards and the OpenGL drivers that, with all the software that was already in the Unix world, was moving over to lower-cost PCs with Linux. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened in the EDA world. And the EDA world is kind of like CAD for semiconductor layout and design and synthesis. So the EDA world, like Mentor Graphics uh, and, and many others, went uh, went Linux. So all of a sudden in 1999, I have no end of job offers. And I'm working at a semiconductor startup that's based in Orlando along with Sunnyvale. I, I work with some guys and knew the IT people that are over on that side, you know, and we, we all kind of kept in contact because we're all working on these new Linux versions of EDA tools, mm -hmm. which were interesting at the time. But I found suddenly, hey, this is my future. I'm really, I've really become uniquely qualified. And, you know, that's when it really started for me. And I've never left Linux since. Wow, great. I can hear that passion in you as well. As you speak about Linux and your experiences, that is tremendously great. Can you explain what EDA is? Uh, electronic design automation. So um, it's, uh, it's basically the CAD for uh, like semiconductor layout, synthesis, other things. Um, it's actually one of the things that actually caused Intel and to work with Dell to release uh, Linux workstations around that time period too, which was an interesting and almost political if you if you get into the depths of it. But it really was the first time you had major companies saying, "Hey, Intel, we want to buy ten thousand dollar PCs with high end graphics, high end computing, lots of memory because we're doing chip layout on these mm -hmm. things. We're designing you know computer chips and laying them out. And we need fast systems, and we want to run Linux because they're a lot faster, a lot more capable." than what we can get on Windows, which Windows was still having a lot of things ported over. And a lot of the EDA, as well as the CAM world for aerospace and, and packaging and layout, had switched over to Linux and not Windows like Microsoft had hoped would happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. So are you surprised now that Microsoft is playing uh, nice with Linux in the sandbox now? Uh, actually, I'm not. Uh, mm -hmm. And a matter of fact, I can even speak to that. Um, okay. Being from Red Hat, the, the interesting thing was Microsoft, in 2009, started slowly going to open source. They'd always had Linux in-house somewhat, but it was always through partners, and they weren't very open with it. Um, they would say, oh, we have that outsourced to so-and-so, and they would never say they're running Linux, even though a partner did. But in 2009, it started to change. Now, at first, Microsoft's like, well, we don't want, to, don't want to work with Red Hat. We'll work, and even started a little earlier in 2007, where the Microsoft's own partners said, hey, we're losing deals because we need to offer Linux alongside Windows, and you're not allowing us to sell Linux. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when the Novell thing started. But even by 2009, they expect interoperability. Now, at first, it was a lot of just upstream stuff. It wasn't in the commercial. But by 2012, 2013, you have Microsoft starting to have the gauge of Canonical, the guys behind Ubuntu, uh, SUSE and Novell again. And then by 2015, the Fortune 500 companies and governments are saying, we will not adopt Microsoft Cloud and service offerings unless you have a partnership with Red Hat. And that's really what did it. It was the governments and the Fortune 500 who relied on Red Hat heavily along with some others, but especially Red Hat, you know, it, it, that Red Hat was the player there, mm -hmm. and said, Microsoft, you will work with Red Hat, and that's what happened. And now Microsoft, it's the opposite. They're they're totally open. They're talking about open daylight and software-defined networking where they're using open source. Um, they're saying, here's what we use, and it's, it's Linux, open source. It's unbelievable. So it's a complete shift in the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for those gems. You know, I, I tell everyone that um, in these Fortune 500 hundred companies that you spoke about, you know, it is heavily Linux based with servers and Red Hat servers and things like that. So thank you for uh, telling everyone what I already knew, but that what they should know. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it's good to have another voice. Yes, exactly. So folks don't think you're crazy and you're living in your own world. It helps. <laughs> so uh, with all the Linux knowledge and things, um, experience that you had, was it easy for you to uh, prepare for the LPIC one? Well, this was funny. I kind of, when I decided to get LPI along with Red Hat, I said, you know what, I think I can pass it. Now, with Red Hat, I had to do more intense study. I looked at the objectives. It was, they were kind of, this is one thing I don't like. It was Red Hat subsidizes some of their cost of certification with training. Uh, there's a little bit about that. It keeps the training costs down, or excuse me, the exam costs down compared to, like, say, Cisco. Mm -hmm. um, but LPI has all their objectives out there, including all the commands you need to know and everything else. So when I started to prepare for LPI, I read up, and I got a book. But 
I spent most of my time still going through the organized book and instructions and everything else. I actually hit the latest, well, actually at the time, I think it was still version one when it was uh, revision of revision one of the LPI level one and two. I actually hit the objectives individually, and I spent, I would say, probably 50 minutes a, a section, uh, and it would be one or two sections a night, and I literally went through, and I was surprised how much I did not know, uh, or I knew some of, but I'm like, wow, I've never looked at this commander. Wow, I've never looked at doing this. And it was really eye-opening. And ever since I did that, that very first time, I said, wow, I think anybody, even they just do Red Hat systems, are never going to touch a, a, a Debian system, are never going to touch a, a, you know, a Gen 2 system. They really should go through all these objectives. And that's since that time, uh, I've held colleagues. I've even taught on weekends in some Linux uh, user groups. Mm -hmm. I've taught the LPI 1 level, uh, level 1 objectives because they are so encompassing and they're so complete. Mm, okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you for that. So um, are there any specific resources that helped you prepare? I know you had mentioned that you looked at a book for LPIC 1. Yeah, I did start with the O'Reilly um, okay. book. And, and, and it was level one at the time. Later, I think they expanded and added level two. Uh, so one and two were in it. There are a couple other uh, books. I remember there was a Wiley book, I want to say, uh, at the time. Um, I ended up just staying with the O'Reilly, but uh, I didn't use it that much. I used mm -hmm. some reference in it, but really the objectives on the LPI side are excellent, especially, you know, if you're coming and you're learning Linux for the first time, you probably want a guided book. But if you're mm -hmm. experienced enough, just, just go through the LPI objectives, mm -hmm. uh, learn where you're strong, learn for, where you're weak, and then you can go back to a resource, maybe even a book or even training to focus on those things. Mm. Great. Thank you. Were there any particular commands that um, you made sure that you knew after you looked at the objectives for the LPI? Uh, you know, it's funny. One command I'd never used, this one's a sticks out in my mind, is the T command, T-E-E. -E. Mm -hmm. I literally didn't know about it. I didn't know you could pipe to it so you can have your, your output on your standard out as well as piping to a file. And being around Unix for almost 15 years at that time, at least 12, but but, you know, a solid seven, eight years, maybe even nine, ten, depending on how you factor it, of Unix and Linux, I had never used that command. <laughs> so that's why I love it. You learn so many commands that you just overlook. So great, great. Was there any other commands besides T that probably took you by surprise? I'm trying to think. I got to brush up on my foreground backgrounding of processes, mm -hmm. um, some job control, the job control. I'd never really gone through, okay, why am I saying dash nine versus nothing, which is the dash 15, sig turn mm -hmm. versus sig kill. Um, those type of, of details that I had, you know, I'd seen other people, I'd read things and, and, and just in use, mm -hmm. use, but did I really understand them? And I actually hit man three signals and, and, and went through all the signals. I'm like, wow, this is what things do. And I learned about, you know, sig hop and, mm -hmm. and sig user one and other signals you can send to programs and the process management and everything else and backgrounding jobs. Uh, it was really enlightening. I'm like, wow, I'm a master, and now I'm sudden I'm very humbled. <laughs> and that's how complete the LPI objectives, even just level one, are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. So, was the exam difficult for you to navigate, or was it? Um, how was it for you, rather? It was fairly straightforward. It's a computer-based testing uh, approach. Um, there are different levels of Prometric and View. I think uh, LPI may be exclusively View right now. I think I took the first time I took it with version one object, the revision one objectives, I think it was a Prometric. And then when I renewed in 2012, uh, one, two, and uh, three core, uh, it was with View at that time. And I think LPI is still specific to View. Uh, it was straightforward. Uh, LPI does not use um, simulations other things. Those cost a lot to develop, and they also cost a lot to publish. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's straightforward. Uh, they are looking for, you know, single answer, sometimes multiple answer, as well as fill in the blank. And they really are trying to drive that. Have you really used the system, or are you really familiar with these things? Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you. So how has being LPI certified impact your life? So it really depends. Um First off, just being LPI certified, even in the Red Hat sphere, does differentiate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that have heard of it, and there are people who haven't heard of it. Uh, there, you'll see a lot of debates online with job listings. Oh, so many say Red Hat percentage versus this and that. And I try not to get into that. And also, it's different. I mean, in some countries, you know, Japan and even Germany, you get quite a bit of LPI. Uh, south of the border here, too, get into South America. Mm -hmm. You can get quite a bit of LPI even versus Red Hat. Um, in North America, it does favor Red Hat a little bit. But... 
it is nice to go in and say, hi, I'm both LPI and Red Hat certified. And they go, wow. And sometimes like, well, we actually do have some embedded systems running in Debian or we do have, we have these various systems and we, we have a problem because we got Red Hat guys that know Yum and RPM, but we need some guys that know D-package and apps. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, I'm your man. You know, I know both systems. Uh, at one point, I was a, a, a Debian maintainer of little note. Uh, and, it, you know, I've really been heavily around Red Hat systems, but it was great to get those details and those things I hadn't really learned in the LPI program. So it really does differentiate, and it always comes up in every interview I have. They'll say, we see you're both LPI and Red Hat certified. And again, sometimes the question is, what's LPI? And other times it's like, hey, we, we actually really do have, we have one other guy that's also LPI certified, mm-hmm. and, and he's really good. So it does definitely help your resume and does differentiate yourself. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. So before, how long after you were LPI 1 certified did you go to get your LPI 2 certification i i took them in sequence so i actually planned it um i studied one week uh for kind of as, i would i would even step back i would say I studied about a month mm-hmm. but the last week didn't cram but did kind of review took a thursday friday i did it at lunch uh 101 and 102 and then the next week i did tuesday wednesday i think for 201 and 202 so it gave me like a three-day weekend to catch up on level two the level two was a bit more difficult than level one and i remember i scraped by on one of them mm. so Great. What advice would you give someone who was interested in the LPI one? So um, definitely plan out your schedule and, and, and having taught the, the objectives myself, um, give yourself six months, especially if you're, you're newer to Linux. If you are seasoned, give yourself a month. Um, try to get a serious four hour session in on the weekend. You really want to hit a couple objectives and then every night study objectives, but you really want those four hours on the weekend to get on a Linux system, whether it's a VM or a pair of VMs, or uh, maybe you have an older system, you know, install, uh, get used to using Linux. A lot of people play with installing Linux, especially when they're newer. And the key is to get on a system, on a Linux system and go through those objectives, actually running the commands and see what they do. Um, so spend those, you know, 50 minutes, less than an hour a night, going through one or two sections, um, and on that weekend, hammering home the usage. So when you get in front of the exam, you're, it's natural. That's the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be, this thing is, this is the greatest thing I handed out before. You can be 20 years experience with Linux. You will learn things in the 101 and 102 objectives. Mm-hmm. You will learn them. So the more you can fill in those sides, the better chance you'll have of passing. If you're a seasoned Linux man, you'll probably pass even with a little study. And when I say seasoned, I mean heavily senior season. Mm-hmm. If you're not, you may may not. So it's really good to fill in all those things. And the greatest thing is in the real world, knowing that stuff will work for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great, great. So what are you doing now, Brian? So I, I bounce around. I still contract. Um, I was recently with HP and Red Hat again. Mm-hmm. Um, I occasionally contract uh, for Red Hat at major accounts. I'm actually working on a, a defense program right now. It's, it's almost ironic. Um, I actually interned back in, and this, I'm going to date myself here, 1991. I actually was an unpaid intern on the project I'm on now. And it's here we are 20, you know, virtually 25 years later, and, and this project's still going on. Uh, but we uh, do war gaming for the U.S. Army. What? And uh, they can simulate things and other things. So it's interesting. It's uh, It came out of my alma mater. It's called distributed interactive simulation Mm -hmm. and uh, it's a real-time simulation because before this project the military used to use a lot of proprietary systems a lot of custom design systems and this was the first time they took off-the-shelf pcs and made a war gaming net out of it and here we are 25 years later and they're still using it wow that sounds great and exciting it's it's interesting it's definitely interesting Mm -hmm. so are you using linux at all during this project Totally. We, okay. uh, we totally use Linux for all the uh, back end. It didn't start off originally like that. I think even the early stuff back in 87 was like a 286 in DOS. Um, and it's been uh, periodically upgraded, but Linux definitely came in and became the primary system in the OOs, the you know, 2000s. And since then, we, we all run, we run Red Hat Enterprise Linux, a um, couple different versions, but most everything we try to stay right on RHEL 6 right now. We're trying to get the RHEL 7 for the next, next uh, not the next major release, but one after that. So, uh, Definitely everything back end um, logic is all Linux. Mm-hmm. Perfect, perfect. And have you noticed any commands from the LPIC certifications and the Red Hat certifications that you use now daily for your job you had to know for the exams? Yeah, and, and, and as I said, we had an issue, uh, I think it was a month or two ago, with the, the LD config and LD 
the LD directory where the LD cache is used to cache libraries. So we actually had a, a vendor, a third party vendor, bring in a set of libraries that was using a different uh, curl library, a lib curl library, which is a uh, remote UH, uh, URL mm-hmm. uh, web service kind of fetching program uh, library. And that's also used by Yum, which is the updater for software and Linux. So we actually had a, a library conflict. And because of LPI and all the study on the LD cache and LDSO and everything else, the shared library cache. We were, I was able to figure that out in minutes. It had taken people a few days. So uh, that was what was very interesting. Um, that's one thing I ran into. Um, I don't really run into much Debian at this position. Um, I can't say the same. And even as I worked on behalf of Red Hat, I'd run into Ubuntu and other systems in their interoperability. I needed to know those Debian commands. And I'm not getting Debian commands on, on, on you know, like packaging, depackaging app. I'm not getting it out of the Red Hat exam. Mm-hmm. So I would say there's just so much use every day. And I kid you not, if people are looking over my shoulder, they're always learning commands from me. And I can tell you what, a lot of them come from the LPI exam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. Thank you for that. What blogs or podcasts do you keep up with to help you stay in the loop of what's going on with Linux? I know you use it heavily every day, but is there anything that you like to read on your own personal time? So um, as a traveler, um, I, I haven't been traveling the last six months, but the last 12 years I've traveled quite a bit. I tried to download different podcasts. I couldn't name some off the bat. Mm-hmm. I would say some, you know, a couple around networking. Um, there has been, the, there's a couple different Linux podcasts, and I'm trying to think of one. It's very interview heavy. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, oh God, the name is, is, is slipping on my mind. I apologize. Uh, I haven't been traveling a bit. That's why I don't know off of, offhand because I haven't listened to it for, for about six months, mm-hmm. but uh, I try to keep my uh, FM radio updated with the subscription, a couple of those. And it's always good to listen because the great thing about those shows is you will actually get a maintainer of the software on there. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember listening to one and they were talking about uh, um, um, SQLite and SQLite is actually public domain. I didn't know it, it's not quite open source and where the inventor, you know, what the maintainer, why he started out with it and what it's become and everything. Um, it's great to get those type of interviews on a lot of Linux shows and a lot of open source shows. Those you get really the background, you get to know why. Because everything in open source, you know, it's like people are like, oh, open source is this designer, that designer. It's like, no, it's just somebody had an itch and they just scratched it. That's mm-hmm. that's what we say. There was something they needed, nobody else had. So somebody out there actually knew how to code and that's where it started. So mm-hmm. just getting those little bits and why they took certain directions, especially when you're frustrated. It's like, why'd they do this? Why'd they do this? If you're listening to a podcast with an interview with the actual guy that wrote it and the maintainers that maintain it, you learn a lot. Yeah, yeah. Podcasts are great. Now, what is your take on scripting? Is it important to know scripting for all of these certifications that you have? Um, Red Hat does have some scripting sections, and they've incorporated it more and more in the system and, and the engineer level. It used to be some of the architect level. Uh, LPI has also gone that direction. They they you know, we'll give you pieces of code on some exams or expect you to write maybe a minimal set command or loop to uh, to do something or, or know at least the structure, the commands that, uh, you know, the actual key keywords that you'd use in bash or something to do something. So I use scripting constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, I also use, and, and of course, if Ross Brunson is listening to this, who's a good colleague, has been around LPI and you, you've seen his name on books with Linux plus mm-hmm. LPI. Uh, I, I am a big ardent advocate of regular expressions and reading the book Master Regular Expressions, which, you know, Ross likes to issue as punishment to people. Um, so and regular expressions are really the big thing I say. If you want to be very proficient with regular expressions, including how to use said and also using the BusyBox version of said, uh, especially for installers and minimal systems, it's, it's really good to know. So learning basic regular expressions, uh, basic syntax for bash, uh, controls. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I think it's really important regular system administration every day you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do and it's everything you do because there's so much even on the distribution of Linux that you can learn just by knowing shell scripting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Can you give the name of that regular expressions book again? Yeah, it's an O'Reilly book. It's another one of the O'Reilly books. It's the, uh, God, I can't, I can't, I think there's an I told me that might be all I can said, but it's called Mastering Regular Expressions. Okay. And, uh, and I always tell people it's a very dry read, but if you can make it through chapter one and chapter two, you've got 90% of it down because chapter one and chapter two really hammer down how it works, why they exist, 
where the syntax comes from, and it kind of hits on a few differences between maybe Perl's implementation versus SED's implementation, a couple other things. But if you can get through one and two and learn how to write a regular expression, a basic one, you've got 90% of what you need down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. What is your take on experience versus certifications? <laughs> yes, this is this is the, the big thing. So I come from a traditional education. I have an engineering degree, uh, focused doubly electrical engineering with focus in computer architecture. And, you know, for example, I learned how to lay out crystal lattices and, and, and dope materials to make semiconductor. And, uh, you know, of course, I don't use much of that. Um, so there's all that thing about theory and the same thing with certifications versus experience. But I always say, coming from that traditional background, I learned most of what I know by interning in college and learning from guys that didn't go to college, uh, the guys that had experience. And the same thing with certification. You, you Certifications are great, and they will differentiate you, um, especially to get through HR. And in my case, the reason why I started picking up certifications is I was doing so much contracting consulting, it was limiting me. Mm -hmm. Procurement departments and partners. If I had to work on behalf of a vendor like, say, IBM or somebody else, they expect you to have a certification. Mm -hmm. It's a credential they can show. So it's not the end-all, be-all, but it is that thing, hey, this guy is proven according to this organization, and that's important, LPI, Red Hat, others. So it's key to have the experience in the first place, but the certifications will differentiate you and get you through those doors. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that some people don't like, and they do feel oh, that's paper. But the great thing, and this is the great thing about LPI, and this is the first thing I say about LPI, it's not just vendor agnostic. It is truly neutral, including LPI does not make money on training. There are mm -hmm. so many vendor agnostic programs out there where their big money maker is training. Mm -hmm. LPI is nonprofit. LPI focuses on the content of the exams and works with training providers and works with resource providers, but they're not out there making quick dollars on just training for their cert. And that's really what makes LPI unique, not just in Linux, but across the entire certification and training spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're a truly important aspect to the open source community. Definitely. That is mm -hmm. that is absolutely true. And they've really been doing it since, what, 1999, I think, or 98. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've really, really tried to build a program that represents the commonality of Linux and to give people, hey, this is an unbiased program. It's not there to sell training. It's not there to sell a product. It's there to be a resource by professionals for professionals. Mm -hmm. Great. So what's next for you, Brian? Uh, well, I am coming up on my recertification uh, with both Red Hat and LPI, so I do have to pass by July or August of next year. <laughs> um, I am doing a couple of security exams uh, probably over the next year as well. Okay. Um, and uh, who knows? I, I am uh, I'm kind of mid-career here. Or if, you, if you look at the IT retirement age, I'm well beyond it. <laughs> but... Uh, I really enjoy the cloud. Uh, I'm also involved with uh, CompTIA with our Cloud Plus currently on their advisory committee. Mm -hmm. um, OpenStack, the great thing is infrastructure. Linux is really becoming commodity. Yes. Everything going forward is, is infrastructure, uh, software-defined storage, software-defined networking. Mm -hmm. I've done quite a bit for Red Hat and then HP as well. One of the reasons they brought me over from Red Hat to work on their uh, Helium uh, products and solutions even though their public cloud is shut down, they're still doing a lot internally as well as a customers as a product. Um, so the cloud is really the cloud infrastructure. And when people say cloud, it's we're talking infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, especially DevOps, where you have in-house development that goes right from those developers to the servers and it can scale up as demand you know, requires. A lot of it's internal, some of it's hybrid out into the, the public cloud and some will stay purely public. There's a lot of development in that area. That's really the future. And, you know, as people are pointing out, Red Hat, if it just stays a Linux company, they got JBoss down pretty good with middleware. They're pretty trusted. But from a Linux and, 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 and platform level, they have to go open stack. Um, if Red Hat doesn't, somebody else will. And Red Hat likes to claim 78% of the paid Linux market. It might even be down to 60%. It all depends how you, how you, you, you factor it. Now, Red Hat overall, probably volume isn't, but the paid and actually dollar amounts the paid is they like to claim 70, 80 percent. Mm -hmm. But OpenStack, that may be, you know, 70, 80 percent of the Linux market in just another three, four, five years. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, why everybody's jockeying to be the open the OpenStack company. Mm -hmm. So 
I, it's going to be difficult for anybody to not be familiar with provisioning, deployment, um, some configuration management, where it's Ansible, Puppet, uh, Chef. Uh, those things are going to be required system administration skills within the next five years. And that's where everything's really moving. Will it be Red Hat as number one? Who knows? It could be Canonical. It could be HP. It could be Google. Um, it's really getting interesting. Uh, Docker's even throwing its hat in the ring because they now have orchestration. So uh, it will be very interesting who comes out on top, what kind of relationships are. But at the same time, who knows if anybody's going to be fully on top. Red Hat and SUSE uh, really took control of Linux, the enterprise Linux, to sustain long term early on. It may be a lot of conglomerates and a lot of uh, different companies. So, and if that's it, then that means the community's really won. It's it's everybody's adding some value. Everybody's contributing the same, you know, the same code. And there's these trusted vendors and people, you know, there's no lock-in. That's what the great thing is. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I was going to ask you where you saw Linux at in five years, but I think you, you answered that one already. So that was great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a commodity at this point. Everybody has it. It's just what are you doing with it? And infrastructure is getting bigger and bigger and more to the stack. Uh, I wouldn't say more complex. We're actually solving. It's funny. The more complex it gets, the more problems we're solving at the same time. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you want to speak a little bit about your security? Uh, you mentioned a security certification. You want to discuss that? Yeah. So I um, I always make a joke, and, and this probably will fall on deaf ears, but if anybody's out there that does work in security, um, I always joke, if I went to DEF CON in Vegas, I'd have to wear a T-shirt that says, too white hat to be the Fed, meaning I end up doing policies, procedures, uh, compliance with updates, um, some SC Linux, don't get me wrong, uh, mandatory access controls. There's a lot of things, especially with containers, that are forcing a lot of people either into the App Armor or the SC Linux, um, you know, multi-container security MCS uh, camps. So there's so much going on in the area. Um, I'm updating my Security Plus because it's old. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been looking at GSEC and a couple others. Uh, still haven't settled. I keep pushing back the CIFSP because I've done so much cryptography. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, a lot of things, especially, it's funny, it, it, coming from aerospace and engineering, some of the first work I had was financial. And people are like, well, how the heck do you go from that to financial? I said, mm-hmm. well, a lot of cryptography, a lot of communications, all the same. You know, encrypting, for example, ACH files, automatic clearinghouse files, which is basically... You buy things and you send money to different accounts. You know, uh, at the end of the day, this storefront bought this and this all gets sent to the bank and whatnot. And the pay- payloads themselves will be encrypted. The communication will be encrypted. I daily both. They're signed on, you know, to verify it came from the right person in addition to being encrypted only to the other receiver. Those type of things. So um, I really need to pick up my CSSP and I've kind of been studying. I've been forcing myself to do that maybe two hours a weekend. Mm-hmm. So I'm ready for it. Uh, I, that's one thing I've really been working on. Uh, but also um, being more in defense again, uh, this, this security template uh, uh, information guide, STIGs, uh, heavy into that as well, uh, just because you know you need secure Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, common criteria. And I've also been involved, uh, I used to be one of run of Red Hat subject matter experts on directory server and certificate systems. So um, if anybody's out there looking into IPA and, and, and IDM, you know, especially working with Samba and Windows Server and that op- interoperability, that, that's where really the hotness is. You wouldn't be surprised if every distribution had IPA on it as a server within the next three, four years. It's really, it's really the killer app, and Microsoft has even hinted now they're not including their services for Unix or basically their, their, they call it identity management for Unix, IDMU. And the new Windows 10 server, which I think is 2016, they're not even including those uh those attributes for Linux anymore. They're kind of hinting that, hey, we want you to do it with what Red Hat's doing with IPA. So yeah. that's kind of uh, an interesting thing. I do want to take the Red Hat 413 exam, which is their architect exam for security. So, Wow, great, great. So how heavily tied is cybersecurity and Linux? Uh, definitely, it's heavy. Um, one of the greatest things in, in working from Red Hat was People say, why am I paying you for free software? And I love always talking about that. It's like, because you're paying us to get what you want. Mm -hmm. Red Hat has the largest concentration of developers uh, of anybody really in the open source world. Now, you do have your HPs and you have your IBMs and even Intels, uh, ARM and others that do a lot of hardware, even Moto and Freescale. Uh, I don't know. I think Freescale's contributions have gone down in recent years. But those hardware vendors do a lot of contributions, especially on the kernel. But you also have Red Hat, who really is a plethora, and Suse Novell, and now their attachment as well, a plethora of developers. And 
when you pay into a company like Red Hat, you can develop things where you want things to go. For example, the NSA. And everybody goes, oh, NSA. Uh, mm -hmm. There's two or three parts to the NSA. The big one that most people listen to, just like uh, the Defense Department with DISA, the information security, the people that are there to make sure things are secure for you. Mm -hmm. You you want to follow certain policies and procedures like the STIGs and whatnot. The NSA wanted mandatory access controls in Linux. NT had them from the get-go, but Microsoft never implemented them right. And, and trying to run with mandatory access controls in NT just breaks everything. The NSA wanted to see Linux have that, and that's where SE Linux came from. And one way the NSA did it was really by hiring Red Hat to develop it. Red, and it was in a very open, you know, everybody got to see what it does. All the codes there. I remember even one one conversation I had when I first joined Red Hat was the Russians don't trust the NSA, mm -hmm. so they make Red Hat build Red Hat Enterprise Linux in Russia itself, mm -hmm. so they can see the code. <laughs> <laughs> and one, but but they love SE Linux. The six sisters in Japan love SE Linux. So mandatory access controls is is one of the greatest things about. I know all distros haven't adopted SE Linux, mm -hmm. but it is a very big thing from a security standpoint. And one of the ways it got in was by the NSA paying Red Hat to develop it. Mm -hmm. and putting their engineers on it with Red Hat. So that's what you're really buying in with, with a lot of commercial uh, endeavors. And Canonical is another great organization, the guys behind Ubuntu. I have many colleagues there. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite managers of Red Hat's now there. Um, we're all working together as a community towards that. And that's that's just beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Final I question. I, mm -hmm. I, I kind of I indirectly answered your question there. I apologize. I, I didn't have okay. to go on those tangents. It was great, great knowledge about everything you said. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm sure our audience will enjoy it, enjoy it as well. I wanted to ask you, for folks that love Linux and are Linux enthusiasts, how do they try to work at, say, LPI or Ubuntu or Red Hat? What can they do to try to gain a position at these uh, Linux places? Well, Red Hat's growing, and I'm pretty sure Canonical's still growing as well. Um, I think it seems like everybody's growing. As long as somebody has a, a successful model mm -hmm. uh, and, and the mind share and, and, and getting companies to, to fund them, they are still growing. Uh, definitely, you know, take contract positions where you know Red Hat or, or, or Canonical are involved because Canonical has their services, professional services as well. HP is another big player. HP Enterprise, I should probably call them now since that's what they are known as mm -hmm. uh, when their services, professional services group. Uh, there's IBM as well. Just getting on projects where those exciting things are happening. Cloud is a big thing, especially the infrastructure as a service and the platform as a service. The open shifts like Red Hat, the um, HP uh, Helion has a development solution that's built around uh, Cloud Foundry. That's another big thing. There's a lot of companies out there that are trying to solve a problem that their development needs to go from developers to deployment. And then not only that, they need to scale it up. So. If a thousand people are hitting their website because they have a, a hot deal going on and where their normal load is only 40 or 50 users, mm -hmm. they got to be able to scale. And the system's got to be dynamic to do that. That's where the new hotness is right now. So the more people can learn, you know, things, uh, deployment, provisioning, um, OpenStack, uh, a lot of things built around that. Uh, Software-defined storage like Ceph, um, software-defined networking, a lot of open daylight works going on, uh, network function virtualization, those type of interests interest you should have right now. Mm -hmm. If you can get some of that knowledge down, even go, you get that foot in the door on a project, you're going to be introduced to Red Hat, Canonical, HP, IBM, others that are out there. The tel From the telcos to Wall Street to Hollywood, mm -hmm. there are going to be opportunities. And that's that's how I found Red Hat. I was working on and off with different colleagues at different companies. And finally, they eventually hired me directly. Great. Thank you so much. So how can someone uh, gain OpenStack experience or cloud experience? Right. So OpenStack is open source and there are distributions of it. Um, Canonical has theirs, of course. Uh, HP has theirs. Red Hat has, uh, and I'll go into the Red Hat just as an example. Red Hat has an upstream, meaning the community, Red Hat distribution OpenStack, RDO. And you can run it on CentOS, which is free. Uh, you can get a Red Hat developer subscription, run it on RHEL. You can run it on Fedora as well. And you can set up two, three virtual machines or even a physical machine. Uh, ideally, you should at least have one physical machine, and then you can also virtualize things under that. Things are getting more and more containerized as well, which saves on overhead. So just picking a OpenStack distribution, and ideally, if you're already familiar with Ubuntu, go with OpenStack already on Ubuntu. If you're familiar with Fedora or Red Hat or CentOS, get Red Hat distribution OpenStack. And just get into, you know, it's it's very broad. Um, you're going to you want to get the basic keying down, basic account set up, basic services set up. But then try to focus in an area because every OpenStack project 
or any cloud project, infrastructure as a service, uh, even the platform as a service, you're going to have specialties. You're going to have people to do the software-defined storage, people to do the software-defined networking. It can get very uh, specialized. And it's great to be broad, but at the same time, pick something you really enjoy. I really enjoyed working on software-defined storage at Red Hat, because especially Red Hat had purchased Gloucester, and they later purchased Ink Tank, which is Ceph, uh, because there were certain things that Red Hat wanted that Gloucester wasn't giving them, especially for OpenStack. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. You gave us so much knowledge today. It has been a true pleasure here working with you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate your time.